So in 2009, somebody had the bright idea of coming up with a clone of Doom, really classic video game from our youth, written entirely in JavaScript. It was about 90 kilobytes, which everybody thought was amazing, but this really pissed off the people at YouTube because the single video watch page at YouTube was about a meg and a half and required several dozen web requests in order to load. So a couple of engineers were sitting around trying to figure out what they could do to fix that, what they could do to optimize it and make YouTube compete with a JavaScript version of Doom. An engineer at YouTube, Chris Zacharias, took a, a weekend or so to actually rebuild the entire page from scratch. He rewrote all of the CSS, rewrote all of the JavaScript, swapped out the bulky Flash video player with one that he had implemented in HTML5, and got the entire video watch page down from a meg and a half to 98 kilobytes and about 14 web requests. YouTube launched the, their Feather interface as kind of a covert experimental beta project that people could opt into. And they figured they'd leave it live for a couple of weeks and see what the stats looked like, see how the page was performing, see how people were actually using the website. They came back to it a week later, expecting to see great results, expecting to see page load times go down, people's interactions with videos go up. They saw the exact opposite. All of the stats that they thought were going to excel had dropped into the toilet and it was taking over two minutes to load their brand new Feather interface, the lightweight, super optimized page. Everybody was kind of depressed until somebody took the time to look at the geographic location of where they were getting their stats from. In addition to places like the US, the UK, Western Europe, where they were used to getting traffic from, they were also seeing people hitting the sites now from South America, Africa, even Siberia places where it was taking more than two minutes to load the Feather interface, and they realized something. These are places in the world where there's a lightweight interface, a tenth the size of what YouTube used to look like, is taking two minutes to load. That means these people used to have to spend 20 to 25 minutes waiting for the YouTube page to load before they even saw the first frame of video. Optimizing their website for low tech, for minimal interface for minimal requirements actually allowed YouTube to reach new audiences that had never before been able to use YouTube. In 2012, I had the chance to visit Haiti. I went with a, a few new friends of mine and we got to visit this island country which at the time was between 60 to 80% unemployment. Today they're at about 40% unemployment. And our eyes were open to just the way Haiti is very different from life back here in the US. In the US, if you want to buy a house, you go out, you get a mortgage, you pay it off over 30 years, you have this nice house where you live in, air conditioning, heat, everything's fantastic. In Haiti, it's cash only. You build your house. You pay for it brick by brick by brick. Some houses take 20 years to build the house before you can actually move in. And it's, it's just a very different society. Here, you drive down the road, you go to Safeway, you pick up some groceries. In Haiti, you drive down a riverbank and hope that it's not raining so that you can find somebody standing on the side of a field with a bag of potatoes. In the US, you pull out your smartphone and you check your status on Twitter and Facebook and you update your blog post. In Haiti, you pull out your phone and you check your status on Twitter and Facebook and you update a blog post. That part hadn't changed. And it was just really, really weird how we're in this place where you have no running water, no electricity, no, no toilets, no roads, and driving down a riverbank, literally a riverbank, there's a random streetlight on the side of the riverbank that was installed by Digicel, the largest telecom company in Haiti, solar powered street lamp with 12 power sockets at the base of it so people can charge their phones. While they might not have electricity in their homes, everybody still has a cell phone because that's how you communicate. If you don't have a car, you can text a friend in town who may or may not be coming through the mountains, hop in the back of their truck and get into town if you need to buy something or sell something or meet somebody or go and visit. It's a very different environment, very different infrastructure than what we're used to in the Western world, but they still use the internet. The downside is they use it in a very different way than we're used to here, and it breaks a lot of our assumptions. Mobile responsive is one of the buzzwords that we use in our industry. What does it mean to take a website that works really great on a retina display and make it respond to somebody using a really low feature iPhone 6 Plus? I mean, I mean those, those things don't have any power at all. So, so we talk about sizing things down, trying to respond in the mobile environment. 
But when you take those two stories into account, what YouTube did to reach places in Siberia that did not have YouTube before, and what Digicel is doing to bring network connectivity to remote areas of Haiti, you realize that responding to a mobile environment, responding to a low feature, low bandwidth, low capability device, looks very different when you step out of the comfortable world of iPhones and iPads and always on entertainment that we have here. To give you an example, my home internet connection is a 30 megabit per second connection. It's not the fastest in the world, it's also not the slowest. I took some time to time how long it would take for different size websites to load. 100K website all the way to a five megabyte website loads in less than a second. A 10 megabyte website takes three seconds. So if you assume that a person can walk about a step, three feet every second, you could take three steps before you load a 10 megabyte website. Not that bad on a really fast internet connection. Some of my friends in Haiti have a 250K per second 2G connection on their phones that they use for Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and everything else that we use back here. On this connection, it takes the same amount of time to load a 100K website as it does for me to load a 10 megabyte website at home. By the time you get to a 10 megabyte website on one of these low bandwidth connections, it takes over five minutes to load the website. Now taking that five minutes, the 327 seconds it takes to load the website, if you think of that back to the one step per second, you could walk the entire length of the US Capitol grounds before that website loads. Now this is all abstract, just talking about sizes of websites. So to give you an idea of what this actually means in the real world, the WordPress Foundation's website is 400K. A random article I picked off of Matt Mullenweg's blog is a megabyte. My own blog is two and a half megabytes, just on the homepage. WordCamp US's homepage is six and a half megabytes. And Wired.com, which runs on WordPress and is a highly performant site that I'm sure a lot of us read here, is 10 megabytes. When you put that into perspective, somebody trying to read something like US WordCamp, the flagship WordPress conference for people who are trying to democratize publishing for the world, takes almost four minutes to load the website on their device. So we just have to remember that mobile is not always equal to mobile. Not all devices are created equal. So what exactly does that mean? Remember, there are almost eight billion connected devices in the world today. This isn't just smartphones and iPads. These are feature phones, Blackberry devices that a lot of us make fun of now because we do have the six, iPhone 6 Plus. But only 39% of these seven to eight million devices are actually capable of using a 3G, a 4G, or an LTE network. In the Western world, which means basically the US and Europe, we have about 50% market penetration of high capability, high feature smartphones. The rest of the world has less than 20%. Some parts of the world have less than even 17% penetration of these devices. And this isn't just saying less than 17% of the people in these countries have high feature devices. It is less than 17% of the connected devices in these countries are high feature devices. 83% of the people probably can't read your website. They can't watch your videos. They can't read your email. They can't interact with you. They can't buy your product. They can't send you information about what they're trying to do with your product, with your technology, or with things that you care about. But this isn't just a problem for the developing world. It's also a problem around even the Western world, the US and Europe, with places where we don't have reliable Wi-Fi. I was at a conference recently where the Wi-Fi was about 200K down, 100K up. This was wired ethernet in a hotel in Las Vegas. Really, really bad network. Somebody sent me a link to an article on starwars.com and I wanted to read the article. It was a pretty cool article, but I can only read three or four lines at a time because the giant graphical banner at the top of the page waits for a JavaScript event in the footer to fire before it resizes and actually gives you the entirety of the page so you can actually read the content. This is something that is happening in places where you just don't have reliable Wi-Fi. Anybody who flew here or is flying home at the end of this conference is probably going to try to play with GoGo -Go in-flight internet or whatever brand the airline happens to have. And you're going to be really disappointed when most of the websites you try to use just flat out don't work. Airline Wi-Fi, hotel Wi-Fi, oversaturated conference Wi-Fi are great examples of what it looks like to have a really low bandwidth device and be restricted in what you can actually use on your network. So what, we can, do, what can we do about it? 
There are different techniques we can use as we build our websites, specifically progressive enhancement and graceful degradation. Graceful degradation is where if your website lacks a feature, if somebody turned off JavaScript, your website still works. It might look crappy, but it's still going to work. Progressive enhancement is where you flip things around, and rather than saying, what do we do if the world breaks, you just assume that people are hitting your website with low feature, low bandwidth devices to begin with, and then you add features on top of your website as more capabilities come online. In addition to that, tools like webpagetest.org allow you to actually test your device from different networks with different speeds on different, different technologies around the world geographically so you can get a real representation of what things look like. Anybody who uses Google Chrome can actually throttle your connection in Google Chrome to simulate a low bandwidth device and see how things break. Later today, when you guys aren't here, seriously go to some of these websites like the WordPress, WordCamp US website, your own website, wired.com, cnn.com, any big website that you normally read on a regular basis, turn on Chrome DevTools and set it to use a regular 2G, 250K per second connection and see just how painful the experience is so that you can figure out what we can do to test for that, optimize for that, and fix that moving forward. But nothing really beats having a device lab actually investing in some of these devices, bringing them into your office, bringing them into your company and testing, what does our website look like on a BlackBerry mobile device? What does our website look like on an AT&T feature phone that has a one inch by one inch screen? Is this still useful? Is it not? Are we still reaching and serving customers who are in these markets? Remember the mission of WordPress, the entire WordPress project, is to democratize the internet and democratize web publishing for everyone. Not just the people who can afford the brand new 17 inch Retina MacBook Pro, but everybody who is trying to publish their story and tell the entire world who they are, what they do, and why the world should pay attention. In 2013, Matt Mullenweg said in his State of the Word that we should all try to be the change we wish to see in the web. It's a great quote and something that I think should inspire all of us to figuring out what can we do to make our websites more accessible, more usable to people who don't have the cool devices that we have, even though we might only want to build stuff for Chrome on a Mac, how does it work on Windows? How does it work in Firefox? How does it work in Opera? How does it work on a small phone? I have a Windows phone. Nobody ever tests their sites for Windows phone. I can only use half of the internet today and I live in the Western world. Imagine people who don't, who don't have access to these devices, who buy a $5 device, who save up to buy a $5 device, who can't read your website, can't publish to WordPress, can't share their story with you. Those are the people that we're trying to reach with WordPress and that is the kind of change that we can make in the world today, the kind of change we can make with the technology that we have. Thank you very much. My name is Eric Mann. I'm from 10up.